All right, here we go. We're doing a show. Welcome to the Arkin Brothers Talk About Movies. Uh, I'm an Arkin Brother. That's an Arkin Brother over there. We're going to talk about Suddenly from 1954, directed by Lewis Allen, starring Frank Sinatra, Sterling Hayden, and James Gleason. Uh, we're always current, always on top of it, what's happening in movies today. We'll see you soon. Talking about cocktails that are stylish, movies great or phony, and how Tony should win and Matthew, and then Matthew should win and Tony. But in the meantime, talking about film in the meantime, the Arkin Brothers talk about movies. You know, I got very confused when you did the cold open there because when you said Frank Sinatra, um, the whole time I was watching it, I thought it was Johnny Fontaine. It was just... Um... It's, it's sometimes hard to tell the difference. Yeah. It is, an John... American citizen. it is Johnny it is Fontaine. It is Johnny Fontaine, right? It's, that's the period of his career. This is the period of his career. Yeah. Right? Where he was Johnny Fontaine. Although he'd, he, he, you know, he'd made a lot of movies by, by this point already. He, yeah, he, but it was but it was dead. He was going through this dead period, and they he needed somebody to put a horse's head in in somebody's bed to get things moving again. Well, I'm not prepared to make any statements about <laughs> what uh, those gentlemen did or did not do. <laughs> uh, they, they, okay. they they say it didn't happen, and I'm I'm fine with that. Yeah, I'm fine right. with that being a fabrication. Okay, <laughs> I I wouldn't know. I right, have no I idea. No, I don't know anything. He but was a singer. Go. He was a singer and an entertainer who. He yeah. was a fine actor. That's yeah, all I know. Right. Um, okay, okay, fellas, that's enough. Yeah, one of my nice. favorite jokes. You know that joke, right? Okay, fellas, that's enough? No. Frank Sinatra saved my life one time. Really? How? How did he save your life? I was coming out of a bar, and, and three guys grabbed me and threw me in the alley and started you know, beating me up and kicking mm. me in the ribs and kicking me in the head and Frank Sinatra came around the corner and said, okay, fellas, I think he's had enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there we go. Okay. But before we get to the movie, how the hell are you? What's I'm going good. On? Uh, the obligatory uh, podcasting uh, rundown of things that we of do in, in our, our life. life. Yeah. Um, everything's fine. Everything's good. I'm excited. We've pretty much finished shooting this movie I've been working on. And... Um, uh, teaching's going well. Writing is going well. I, I, I'm happy. Right. How, how are you? I'm good. Good. I, I had another podcast experience this past week. You uh, cheated on me with another ch- podcast. Uh, well, just as a guest. I was you're invited too fresh. In... Yeah, there you go. Uh, my partners and I were in, in Batch 22 were invited onto a podcast called The Happy Half Hour which is a weekly podcast from San Diego Magazine about uh, it's, it's restaurants. Is it a massage show or what? <laughs> oh, boy. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, and that's our show. Top um, secret, get out of here. What kind of a show? It's, it's a dining show? Yeah, it's dining and dining and drinking and restaurants and nightlife and food around San Diego County. Um and, uh, this is a good job that you you're lining up for yourself. This yeah, really has some nice perks to it, yeah, especially since the happy half hour went for an hour and fifteen minutes, and we were making cocktails on the podcast. And uh, oh my god! And, and we got drunk. We all got we all got plastered oh. on the podcast. It was did it, did anything untoward happen? Um, I did a lot of imitations of dad. Really? Yeah. Because when... in, in in telling the story of Batch Twenty Two, I have to tell the story about how. You know, my father called me one day and said, you know, you can make aquafit at home. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, went right. on, it, went, it went on from there. Right. Um, and uh, and uh, it was it was a lot of fun. And I realized that I could probably improve this podcast by by getting drunk because, you know. Oh, I thought you said we we're going to say by doing imitations. <laughs> we could do that, too. We could do imitations. Uh, we do whatever we want. It's our podcast. 
you getting drunk and doing imitations sounds like a great podcast. Getting drunk and doing imitations. Just a podcast. <laughs> get people yes. on the air to get drunk. A tempting to do. But that would be the gimmick. It would be tempting to do imitations you'd never done before. Like the yeah. first time you're trying to do so-and-so. Right. Yeah. yeah. And it would be fun to do things like, here, do I want you to do John Wilkes Booth. Like people you could never have even heard. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Do your best John Wilkes Booth for us. You and I, could... I said John Wilkes Booth is sort of a segue into this movie that we're doing this week. But uh... Well, we have a support already. S- Stephen Jules Rubin says, I'd quit my job uh, that I don't have for that, which is, I think, a, 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 in support of the idea for the podcast. That's what I'm hoping. My imitations of y'all's dad is one of the last things made my grandpa smile. Oh, my God. That's wow. so sweet. Wow. Wow. That's well, that very... means one day you'll have to do that for us, um, Stephen. Um, so that was a pretty good imitation of Dad. Uh, that was pretty good. Yeah, it's fun. It, it's not as good as the silent imitation that I do of Dad, which, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of an imitation of Dad, just standing yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. What's really fun is to do an imitation of Chris Guest doing his imitation of Dad. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. That's good. Um, um, it's funny that, you know, I mean, it's not that funny that Dad comes up in, in our conversations, him being our father, you know. Uh, but it is interesting today regarding this movie for, for an interesting reason. Do you, would you know why? There's something about this movie. Oh, well, I, I, yeah, it's in my notes. I, I talked about this movie having um, similarities to Key Largo, Wait Until Dark, and even Rain, in that it's it's somewhat of a locked locked room, one one location. Yeah, you're, everybody's stuck in one place. Right. Kind of movie. Well, and actually, like, you just mentioned two of those being great options for this month's run of what we're going to call uh, home invasion movies. Um, Key Largo is kind of a home invasion movie. Yep. And um, so is Wait Until Dark. Yeah. We could do Wait Until Dark. Dad would I'll be, be a monkey's uncle. Dad would be upset. With Dad us. would be upset with us if we did Wait Until Dark? I don't know. I, I, I think, he, I don't know if that's <laughs> a movie he loves to, to discuss or. Then we won't have him on as a guest. <laughs> well... How can you say a terrible thing like that? <laughs> you know. um, no, the thing I was thinking of, that's a good point, but the thing I was thinking of is that is that uh I I I've heard him say this that James Gleason is one of his favorite actors. Jimmy Gleason is an actor he uh adored growing up and I think you can see uh some of Gleason in dad's work when he's playing guys from the 40s. Uh-huh. He really is like in the Rocketeer, he is yep. so Jimmy Gleason in that movie to me. I think That's he was true, doing yeah. a kind of an homage to him. He loves Gleason, ah. yeah. And and you think back, you know, he was in some great great movies, uh, and he's always just fantastic. He just comes in, does his stuff, no nonsense, gets out of there. It's great. Huh. Huh. Yeah. He is. He's pretty great, and he's he's actually my favorite thing in this movie. A hundred percent agree with you. I, he's just so um, so energetic, and yeah. this was near the end of his life. He was not well. But really? No, I didn't know, know it. Huh. Um, you know, one of the things that that I was really personally uh, very exciting to me in this movie is. You know, my, I'm sure you remember this, but you were pretty young at the time that, um, you know, I went to, to boarding school with, with Matt Salinger, who was uh, the son of the legendary author J.D. Salinger. And um, Matt and I became uh, good friends in boarding school. And then through us, Dad and, and uh, J.D. Salinger, or Jerry, as people called him, became friends. And there were actually times when we went up and visited them at their home. And there were times when... when um, Jerry Salinger came down and visited us at our home in Westport. Um, and I didn't know that he'd had a movie career. And it was so exciting to see him playing the the deputy at the beginning of this 
film. Um, I, I, I was so surprised. Um, it's like the, the beginning of that scene. I'm like, oh, my God, it's J.D. Salinger. It's, as it, the it, deputy. It, really, it really is. It really is. So if, if, yeah. if for those of you out there who have read, you know, Franny and Zoe, Raise High the Roof Beam Carpenters and Catcher in the Rye and are fans of J.D. Salinger, but have no idea what he looked or sounded like, just watch suddenly and you'll just see. just read a sudden day for banana fish <laughs> yeah <laughs> suddenly <laughs> banana fish uh, um yeah that's spot on yeah i i i i i knew that face when i saw it in the movie but i couldn't remember who it was reminding me of yeah and now you're. I don't think it was reminding you. I think it was him. In you know, it's him. Uh, but but using a different name because you know he didn't want to. Yeah. Dilute his writing career. Of course. Um, <laughs> why would he? Um. So uh, yes. Yeah, so the movie. Well, let's get down to it. Yeah. All Where right. did you see this fine uh, this fine uh, historical epic? I saw it on YouTube. Okay. Uh, and I saw it actually ex- right where I'm sitting right now, uh, a few days ago, sitting in this, this uh, I'm, at, I'm in a casita, a tiny little casita in L.A. Uh, behind a friend's home that I use uh, when I have to be up in L.A. to do work for Batch 22. And uh, I sat here and I watched it on uh, on YouTube. That's 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 great. I couldn't think of a better way to, to see a movie. In a tiny, cramped, claustrophobic <laughs> on, room. On the which, internet. Yeah, which is kind of what the movie's about. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, were you surprised? Had you seen this before? Did you know anything about it? I'd never, I'd never even heard of it. Yeah. I hadn't even heard of it after you told me about it and said we were going to do it for this week's movie. That's how obscure this mo- movie Because you immediately forgot what I said. The no, same, I knew. Like, you'd not heard of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um... I hadn't either. I think the most surprising thing about it after you see it is that you've never heard of it before because it's not a, I don't care. I'm going to come right out and say, this is a pretty badly directed movie. It's pretty poorly directed. Really? It's not that it's so good. You can't believe you've never heard of it. It's just that it's about things that you didn't know happened this early in the fifth, like that you, I didn't know they were making movies about this kind of thing. In 1950, what, 1954? Yeah, 54. 54. Yeah, it, it does seem way ahead of its time in a certain way. Yeah. You don't Although, like me, do you? The fact of the matter is, presidents have been getting assassinated in this country for a long time. Well, yeah, that's true. Or attempts attempts to, uh, for yeah. sure. But but they it had not been something so frankly dealt with in a in a major movie. I, I that was a big surprise. And also the kind of um cackling psychopath character that Sinatra played not not so much cackling, but like the crazy unhinged psycho killer who Sinatra plays fairly well in moments. Um I, yeah. I was he... was kind of like new on the scene too, although I think he was really just kind of doing a Richard Widmark, you know, who probably you could say started that trend. But but it all, well, the other thing that's interesting is that as bad as the movie is in so many ways, in in the writing, I felt like they made some attempt and and kind of a nuanced and 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 advanced attempt to explain how and why this guy became what he is yeah and and with all of its jingoistic you know america first you know duty and all that stuff crap that they talk about throughout the whole movie there's this underlying theme of like yeah i was in the army killing people for the army and it destroyed me and turned me into a monster i killed 27 men all by myself I want a silver star medal. Well, yes, although I agree there there's a there's a slight difference in that he, they kind of describe him as somebody who was already psycho waiting for the excuse that the army didn't turn him bad that that it gave what was already this 
And he he was a bad apple, you get the feeling, but also they describe him having a rough childhood, which I thought was really unique. Yeah. You know, that a guy that, that is doing something in a movie that is probably in 1954 the most heinous thing that you could think to say to do in a movie, right? Right. Particularly um, when Eisenhower was president, yeah, who right? was just beloved. Um, and then in that movie to also unpack his backstory and give him some kind of reason for his problems was pretty advanced in yeah. the screenwriting. I, I, the I, guns one of my favorite li- bad. Depends on who uses them. One of my favorite lines in the movie that when she, when the, she asks him, "Haven't you any feelings at all?" and he says, "No, I haven't, lady. They were taken out of me by experts." And the that that's how he describes his parents is yeah, pretty telling. Yeah, and and the reference to killing them, which you think he probably did. Oh no, no. I mean, it, this this is this movie's poking at some really weird dark places for 1954 yeah for a movie with you know i mean it's not an it's probably like a kind of a b b b plus movie it's it doesn't have huge stars in it sinatra was trying to be one sterling hayden was always at the same level of not stardom slash stardom slash i don't want to be here (laughs) that he was always in he really does seem not to want to be in the movie in this movie yeah but he always seems that way. He doesn't seem to want to be in The Godfather. He's well, he doesn't want to. He never wanted to act. Oh, the poor guy. No, you know his story? He and dad would have been great friends. <laughs> you know you know his backstory at all? No. Sterling Hayden, for those of you who don't know who we're talking about, he's he's the hero star of this movie. And um, he's in Dr. Strangelove. He plays General Jack Ripper in Dr. Strangelove and a lot of uh, noir films. And he was he was a a, a sailor. He was uh, just loved being on boats, and all he wanted to do was sail. And he was discovered for his kind of his looks. He was really tall, kind of like a um, you know almost a John Wayne vibe. Very tall, big, burly, handsome guy. And um, and he just worked because he wanted to get money for his boat and to take ocean trip. Like he he fell into it, and he was embarrassed by it apparently, and like didn't really want to be a sex symbol and didn't want to be in the movies he just kind of got lost in it yeah um, well the the Loggins and Messina Vahivala was actually written about him just wanting to sail all the time people don't know that well it might be that's I, because I'm in love with you a book called <laughs> Wanderer about the fact that he like instead of paying taxes he just got on his boat and went to went offshore for three years <laughs> and was, was a wanted man. <laughs> He's a real character. I mean, he really wow. was. Yeah. Um, wow. And he must have been in the war, right? Was he I, shot? I, I think so. He he certainly looks like. I mean, he's the type. He, he a lot of those guys had been in the war. Um, he looks like somebody who caught some shrapnel. He he has a, a lot of authority for what he lacks in in uh, in like Talent? in. Okay, yeah, I'll give you that. I mean, I'm a huge. I love him as a movie star. He's 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 perfectly used in a lot of movies. But when he just has to act and he doesn't have a director and it's not well shot, it it, it just looks like he's he's hoping that it's over soon. You want to go to the well? Movie? He'll... No, it's a war picture. Mama let me see war pictures. Delivered one of my favorite m- movie lines of all time. I've risked a thousand young punks. <laughs> I've risked a thousand young punks in my time. He's yeah. I mean, he's just great when he's when he's well used and it's right like there or or the killing. He's great. This, in the killing. Is, uh, this I didn't know. Um, Stephen Jules Rubin says he's Greta in the Long Goodbye. I don't remember the character of Greta, um, but um, it was that was also very ahead of its time. Very ahead of his time. Yeah, oh. <laughs> um, he is. He is. I assume you mean great, Jules, and and yeah. yeah, he's great in that. Long goodbye is you know a real favorite of mine, and he's he's great. That's also so sad because he apparently had a pretty rough drinking problem, and I think that was exploited in that movie a little bit. Um, yeah. Anyway, Sterling Hayden, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, sheriff's the first man they shoot to the moon, and a rocket will take pains too, because that's never been done before. 
That's true. Yes. That's true. Um, so, yeah. So, suddenly. So, uh, suddenly, suddenly is about... Uh, what is it about? You want to tell everybody what it's about? Suddenly is about um, a... Uh, an, an unannounced sudden trip that the president of the United States is taking to a, uh, a ranch and the train is going to have to come through this tiny little town called suddenly where nothing ever happens. It used to be kind of a gold rush town, rootin' tootin' shootin' town, but that was long ago. And now it's just a backwater where nothing happens. And uh, then the, the, the sheriff finds out that the president's coming in and the Secret Service is all, uh, all, all, all exercised because there's been a threat against the, the president, and uh, they got to make sure he... What the Hades is going on in this bird? Did some galoot make a uranium strike? Yeah, there you go. All kinds of excitement. And uh, lo and behold, Frank Sinatra and two henchmen show up, and uh, they take a, uh, a woman and her son and her... Uh, father hostage in their home because it's got a good vantage point to shoot the president when he steps off the train uh i don't know what to use the restroom why is he going to step off the train in that that's town? not really explained i yeah. I, I think that he For has a, reason, he's visiting a friend yeah he's going to step <laughs> a college off buddy the, the college buddy is in suddenly yeah yeah um, one sound and, from the kid pup and he's dead you stink bitch shut up yeah and uh, so that's it. They, they're locked in a house with this woman and her... her uh... Now, as luck would have it, the woman is a war widow and the sheriff is in love with her. So they have to stop by and check on things. They also have to check it out because they can see from the train station that it has a good vantage point. So they got to check it out. And everybody ends up stuck in the house. So it's really like all this, uh, all this setup doesn't really pay off terribly well, except to get these guys in the house as kind of a home invasion lockdown <clears throat> yeah. movie, yeah. where they're all under the gun of these three gangsters. Yeah. And um, and, and we do have point... to say that the way that the the Secret Service finds out about the plot against the president is because of a stool pigeon named Smiley Bitters. Which I have in my notes. It's one of the great names of all. Stool Pigeon Smiley Bitters. It, here's the thing. When we do the recast, you and I are both going to audition for the role of Smiley Bitters. <laughs> and hope. <laughs> yeah. And be crushed Smiley when bitters. we don't get. We can't even get cast in an off-screen role. Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> We would like to uh, audition for the person that people think of when they see this character. Yeah. Yeah. Or when they I hear had, about I this character. I had something similar to that once where I had, a, I had a role in a movie once where I think I had about 30 seconds of screen time. And everybody thinks it's a huge, huge role because he's talked about all the time. Mm-hmm. In An Unmarried Woman, there's scenes where they're on the phone with me. You know, there's all kinds, of, but I'm not in those scenes. I wasn't there. There's, yeah. there's uh, talked about. It's like, oh, you were the boyfriend. Yeah, I could have been cut out of the movie, and it still would have been a big part. <laughs> I got but, a stomach. Ache. Take a pill. It's like playing lefty. How do you feel? What? Where? How do you uh, fall on Sinatra? On actor Frank Sinatra. I know. I know actor. Busting my leg on a stage so I can yell down with the tyrants. You know, I um, I actually kind of really liked him in this movie. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Our producers are so on top of it. Oh my god, they're so quick. Um, yeah, he. Uh, I didn't feel like he chewed up the scenery too much. Um, one thing he did that really impressed me was the 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 transition from F, when they're impersonating the FBI guys and then they don't have to anymore. Their FBI guys were great. Like you totally would have bought them as FBI guys, not psycho killers pretending to be FBI guys. And then when suddenly they have to reveal who they are, when the change comes, I was like, oh, that's pretty good. That's pretty subtle. They're stinking traitors. They're Benedict Arnolds. 
I mean, you could argue that the problem with it was its subtlety. Like, I, you know, this move to me, this movie demanded Peter Lorre, like just tearing oh. it apart. <laughs> you know, I, I, it was begging for a, a driveling, like, you know, scene grabbing psychopath. Yeah. Because it's so boring. <laughs> it's, it's like an hour and 10 minutes long or something. It's so short. Yeah. And it, it's an hour and 17 minutes long. Yeah. And it, it feels long. It, it like drags. And I don't know how they do that. Four minutes of interesting action crammed into 117 minutes. Yeah. Of film There's time. one bit of action I liked. And actually, the, the, when, the, when they open fire in the house, there's a brief shootout in the house early on. Yeah. <laughs> That's actually pretty tight. That that was a pretty well edited little sequence. Yeah. And then it disappears and nothing after that has any style or rhythm or pace. It's really leaden. And the, and the pacing one great, is bad. One <laughs> one great <laughs> shot though that that got me not not a great shot but a moment where where they all have where where some of them have to go down in the basement to hide. And earlier in the movie, they'd wrapped a body in the blanket and brought it down to the basement. And as they walk down into the basement, you see the the rolled up, just part of the rolled up rug with the feet sticking out of it. And, oh, and I it, didn't catch that. They don't have a direct, they don't have a close up shot of the rug or there's like no reference made to it. It's just right. there stuck on the corner is a rug with the feet still sticking out of it. <laughs> and it was, it was pretty, that was pretty impressive to me. Um, yeah, it, this, the, the director, Lewis Allen, uh, you know, he just didn't, he just didn't have the, the, the level of insanity needed to make, like it needed like Robert Aldrich, some kind of fever dream, <laughs> like Rosemary, like not like, uh, you know, uh, like baby Jane level fever dream. Yeah. Stuff. You're getting too fresh. Another you know, thing like, that would have been nice is if they had been able to cast as the kid, I'm sorry. I know he's a kid and I shouldn't be harsh, but there are there are kids who can act and there if they had cast as the kid, the kid from the Russians are coming and and um How about Robert Blake? Yeah. Robert They should have cast Robert Blake in that part. Yeah. They're hurting Pidge. No um. <laughs> Is Pidge is the actor who plays Pidge <clears throat> the actual real life son of the actor who plays his mom cuz aren't their names the same well they look very much i actually wrote down how much they look alike no kim kim charney played pidge and nancy gates plays ellen oh but there's another there's another pidge, darling, um, i made it especially for you you made it because you wouldn't let me wear my gun. I see the problem that I had. I was looking at their character names. Oh. Which are, they have the, the same, same last name. Being the you mother. Know, I bet I can guess what's on your mind. Of the mother. They would have yeah. similar, at least similar names. So, yeah, yeah, that's brilliant writing, actually, to give, to give uh, characters smart. to a mother. This is, and... yeah, this is where they don't fail you. <laughs> in this movie the level of reality that they're bringing yeah but where i fail you as a podcast host because... no now come on <laughs> no no that's the name <laughs> it's a funny name i really feel like you know i sinatra is um i can feel him trying to figure out how how to do this like it looks like he's he's calculating a lot through this movie of like I don't want to go full crazy because that's going to be bad for my image and bad for my career later. I need to find a way to make this guy, you know, because I the movie's begging for Richard Widmark to throw yeah. a, a, a lady down a flight of stairs <laughs> in, in, a, in a wheelchair. You know, I mean, it, it, that level of 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 glee in being bad would have been would have saved this movie it would have made it really entertaining and uh he played it a little safe and the director didn't give anybody any help yeah. and obviously jimmy gleason is just like he's not going to take direction he's going to be like ah shove it i'm doing it my way you know <laughs> so you know it really um but it is interesting how 
you can see him deciding to become a movie star <laughs> around this yeah. time. You know, it was interesting that I, I wish I could talk to Frank or somebody who was there about it. Um, what in um, that he had this terrible scarring on his neck from uh, his uh, forceps birth when he was when he was born, and they actually they actually thought he was dead when he was born. He was like put to the side. They thought he was dead, and then somebody picked him up and he started talk breathing. He started talking. Well, <laughs> he started. <laughs> That's insane. When you've got a gun, you are a sort of god. If you had the gun, I'd be the chump and you'd be the god. The gun gives you the power of life and death. God, can you imagine a baby saying that? <laughs> that would be terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> he started he started breathing. And um, he's, uh, but so he had this terrible scarring on one side of bo below his ear and on his neck. Which actually gave him the the nickname Scarface when he was a kid. They call it, that's what his nickname I, was. I never knew. I never knew this. Wow. And he did not like to be photographed from the left side. Um, because he and, saw this movie. Uh, yeah. Because they don't hide it. But they don't. And I'm wondering what what would be curious is if for this movie. Because to I kept wondering is that makeup? Is that did they give yeah, this it's, character scar? I thought so too. And and that's why I did some research on it. Um, yeah, I actually, for once, actually did some work and research and preparation. I would have thought um, that would have been a, a piece of trivia that you would have known already about his I, scarring. Well, you, I know that you like Sinatra. I know you like the music. You know, you don't like me, do you? Do I? Big fan of the music. Never really followed the scarring okay. so much. Um, <laughs> sure, that's it. Ain't it a beauty? But shucks, she doesn't like guns. Yeah. <laughs> Big um, fan of the music. Didn't really like the scarring. So. <laughs> no. But so I'm wondering if that was uh, somewhere a choice. Because he's, they they almost feature it, you know. They it's really, very prominent. Yeah. It's very um, prominent. That's and, really interesting. And to have scarring that... that um, pronounced and not on a character like this and not reference it like they could have referenced something from the war or you know look what i got from my troubles or you know who knows well the whole the, the reason it's so powerful is they don't say anything about it to oh, me it's like it's a text well it's just like you wonder about this guy like where did you know what what happened did, was this a war injury was this did it happen yeah. in a prison like so what? Hades is going on and it, movie um, making 101 show don't tell yeah and it shows him to be a survivor of some pretty heavy things somehow which yeah. is uh, makes him more like he's such a tiny guy in this like sterling hayden looks like a silverback gorilla compared to him i mean sterling hayden is huge <laughs> right yeah and, 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 and frank was five foot seven irl well, as my daughter. i know actor busted Luckily, I'm, he's, you know, around my height. It's a good height to be. I'm it a little is. taller than that. Yeah. I was taller than Frank Sinatra. I learned something. Uh, I was. I still am. I'm much taller than him now. <laughs> Reputedly, Lee Harvey Oswald watched this movie a couple of days before the JFK assassination? Yeah, I, I, I heard that rumor. Also, another weird tidbit is that it's produced by, like, what, Virgo Productions or something? And there's a... Or Libra yeah. Productions? Or, I Libra. don't remember what... Libra. And there's a tie-in to him through that, too, right? Yeah, there was a book about... A book or a movie about him called Libra. Called Libra. That that's may some, have been his code name or something like that. That's so. some weird uh, Zodiac killer <laughs> stuff. That's some strange... Those are some strange uh, pieces of trivia. Yeah. Um... Uh, yeah, this... Dad! Dad, are you all right? Well, I guess I'm all right. It could scare the pants off me, that's all. Golly, look at this! What? His voice. His voice is unbelievable. If you want to see, if you ever thought that combining Leave it to Beaver and the Manchurian Candidate would be a good <laughs> idea, this is the result. Except that it's kind of like the... the, the, the uh, the combination of the worst things about both of them, which... You're a dirty, lousy gangster! 
Admittedly, there's not a lot that's wrong with Manchurian Candidate, but <laughs> if there were, it would be in this movie. <laughs> You're a bunch of cowards. There's one shot in this movie that really kind of blew me away, though. And it, yeah. it's it's it makes me wonder about things because that this shot and the feet sticking out and the rug and the couple little details that we've liked may be, make me pause for a second and go, am I, are we missing something? Is this better than we think? Does it know what it is more than we think it, it does? And it's the only time this happens in the whole movie. They're kind of pestering Sinatra trying to get him to lose his cool so that they can maybe get the gun or take control. Oh. And he starts going on. I think it's one of the first times he starts going on about the how they treated him in the war. And he comes in, walks directly into a close-up from across the room and looks into the camera Yeah, for one line. And they never do it again. They never, ever have anyone except for this guy, look near the camera <laughs> or look, certainly look into the camera. Um, and that was really weird and, and pointed because it, it never, they never do it again. Um, and it's, it's either happening on a line that's really crucial that I missed, or it's just not <laughs> like, it's a great idea, but kind of misplaced. <laughs> I, right. I, I don't know, because this movie has no impact. Like it ends, and kind of crazy things happen at the end, and it and, and, it, and it's very punchy, and it, I, you're just left going, huh, huh, huh. Well, the sheriff does get the gal at the end of the movie, you know. Well, thank goodness she thank comes goodness. to her senses. Comes and to her. Can I pick you up at church tomorrow? You know, sometimes Matthew murdering people is a big responsibility that you just yeah. have to you have yeah. to take on. Well, and I do have to say, you know, when a woman says to you, "Can I pick you up for church tomorrow?" Can I pick you up for church tomorrow? You know, <laughs> you know that there's going to be something to atone for. Thanks. <laughs> there you go. Hey, I was trying to figure out how to get there, and you did it. You, 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 yeah, you finished it for me. <laughs> Couldn't quite figure out the best yeah, way to get the, there. The key word is tomorrow. Yeah. Can I Not do you want to go to church right now? Yeah. It's like, do you want to go to church tomorrow? Yeah. That's kind of. I thought you wouldn't mind, Mom. That's a good pickup <laughs> line. Do you, do you have a favorite line in this movie? I do. Um. Oh, let me look through my notes because <laughs> yes. Thanks. I mean, any time that Jimmy Gleason says, "Well, I'll be a monkey's uncle." <laughs> I'm in. Good. Yeah. But I'll be a monkey's uncle. I mean, I know it. Tell me yours while I'm while I'm check checking here. Ellen, will you please stop being a woman? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Oh my god. Fantastic. <laughs> Here's one of my favorites the, from the deputy from uh your friend um J.D. Salinger? J.D. Salinger. <laughs> what the Hades is going on in this burg? Did some galoot make a uranium strike? Uh, what the Hades is going on in this burg? Did some galoot make a uranium strike? <laughs> yes. I have Thank that in my know. note. Oh. Uh, Ellen, now listen to me and don't look like that. <laughs> don't look like that. I had a question, too. Um, there are phones... There are phones featured prominently throughout this entire movie, right? Mm -hmm. And yet when the telegraph cable comes in at the beginning of the movie that they have to tell the sheriff about, does he pick up the phone that's on the desk and call the sheriff and say, come over here, I need to talk to you about something important? No. He sends somebody running through a, a two-minute chase sequence throughout the town running 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 to yeah. the sheriff's office to say we need to have you over at the train yeah. station it's like a scene from oliver twist it's <laughs> yeah. like what why didn't you send a carrier pigeon yeah for that for that one moment there were no trump phones in the town um, there is one 
I think legitimately, well, there's a few, but one legitimately good line that, that left out, leapt out at me. Um, she says to Sinatra, you're an animal. Animals kill each other to live. And he turns to her and he says, how do you like your roast beef? Medium. Ah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. I remember that. You know, it's like maybe they had a good ghostwriter come. It feels like they they hired somebody for a couple of days. Like they hired, you know. But they had a limited budget, so they said we're going to hire you to put four and a half good lines. In yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and Dashiell Hammett was like, "Yeah, okay, I'll I'll give you four lines." Yeah, that's all we can afford. Oh my god. Um, I do. <sighs> We have to talk about the ending of this movie, and for those of you who want to see it and don't want to be surprised, go watch the movie and then listen to the rest of this podcast later, because yeah. we're going to spoil the ending of it. Surprise, surprise, they don't get away with it. They don't kill the president. Obviously, that's not going to happen in 1954. You ruined the whole movie. They suddenly. Were... Um, suddenly, we did. And um, they have this elaborate plan to uh, use a, a sniper rifle from a house on a hill that's overlooking the, the train station, the depot, where they believe he'll get out of the of the court. Why they think he'll get out or have any, they'll be able to have a clear shot at him or any of that is not very well detailed, nor is the geography of it. Clearly the house is in Studio City and the town is in San Bernardino. and it's August, it's up it, by Santa Clarita. Uh, exactly. And, um, and, uh, you know, I'm no actor. You're no actor. You said it. And, um, <laughs> I don't even know where I was going with this, but, um, a good line. You said there was a good line. I already said that. Thanks. And, oh, we <laughs> know. So, so they're going to use a sniper rifle to take him, the president out. And, uh, they're in the living room of this family with the perfect view out the window and they have to attach the the gun because it's so heavy and powerful to a to the table what's the gun for and they make a big deal out of it being a metal table oh it's i wanted it to be wood but it's metal and oh damn and uh and the tv which is right next to it they just make this whole deal throughout that it's busted and they gotta get a repairman to fix the tv and you're like oh my god of course these two things are going to align and um, they uh, they pull a fast one. Jimmy Gleason spills a glass of water on the floor into which uh, one of the henchmen steps when he's firing the gun, and they electrocute they 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 electrocute him. Yeah, which isn't possible if you're wearing rubber shoes, which the guy is. I just <laughs> but I'll give I'll you know. It was an exciting idea, so they did it. So, here's another, like, uh, first-ish thing. Kind of reminded me of, uh, they got there before Bonnie and Clyde, before The Godfather. Oh, with the multiple shooting and the, the guy, the gun, and the like, shooting. he's getting electrocuted, no, getting no, shot, no, and no, just no. stays there for five minutes. That, that was that was a pretty early version of that. Yep. Plus, and when the other henchman gets shot up in in the town, when he goes to get some information and gets caught, that's a pretty good shootout there. Yeah, with Paul Frees. Yeah, who, who is a really good example of why voiceover people and commercial actors should maybe not be in movies because other it's than, kind of other just, than us, other than us, I would say that we have to face this. It's <laughs> not... like you were supposed to grow up and be president. Well, we are not well enough known for that to be the problem, but this is a guy's voice who you've heard in every cartoon and every Disney movie and every documentary and right. classroom movie from the 50s through the 70s, the voice. And yeah. every time he shows up in a movie as a character, I'm just like, how'd they get this VO guy to, to show up? To, to pretend to act. I guess it's because he looks so much like a gangster. Yeah. What is the casting going? What is that choice? Well, I thought that they looked really great. I today. disagree with that. No? No, I, di I, I didn't think that they captured the gangster part of it very well. And I was frankly yeah, disappointed yeah, yeah. when it was gangsters. I thought that was a, that was a writing misstep. You're a dirty, lousy gangster! Oh, you 
Leave him alone, Benny. Do you hear what he said? Yeah, I heard what he said. <laughs> Just... <laughs> yeah. They should have been commie if I, radicals. If, if I was trying to kill the president and somebody called me a gangster, that would really... That would push me right over the edge. And you're getting too fresh. This is the most pro-gun movie I've ever seen. Oh, God, my God. And the guns, guns aren't are... necessarily banned. Depends on who uses them. Yeah, uh, that's... Yeah. Never heard that before. Yeah, yeah that... Um, this is like a really pro-gun, pro-Americana movie. Like, really heavy-duty. Um, they they make no bones about it. And, the, you know, the thing about it that's like most... Uh, shocking in a way is that it's so pro-gun that they have the courage to show you the bad parts of it too but you got to do it anyway yeah you know what i mean yep we thought you wouldn't mind mom well as frank sinatra not for as, as john wayne said in one movie or on another there's some people who just need killing well yeah yeah um so um what would you double feature this movie with? There's a billion choices, actually, I think. Yeah, uh, I probably would... What did I say? My notes are a little scattered today. I think I would combo it with The Desperate Hours. All right. You want to go to the movies? Choice? I did In the Line of Fire. Okay. Another crazy, you know, guy going to kill the president. Right, right. Um, yeah, there's two. It's kind of an interesting mashup of two classic genres of the home invasion movie and the presidential assassination movie, yeah. of which there are many. And uh, recasting? Oh, recasting. I had some fun. So I want to I want to remake this movie in the 70s. Yeah, right. Good. And I want to cast um, Bo Hopkins as the sheriff. Excellent. And I want to cast Telly Savalas as Frank Sinatra's character. Oh. Okay. I want to cast Art Carney as Jimmy Gleason. Tuesday Weld as Nancy Gates. And Richard Mazur as one of the other henchmen. But That's I don't know. Fantastic that. Richard Mazur. Oh my god. That's my recast. That's great. Like Grindhouse like seventies Grindhouse version. I think oh, my would, God. I think it would work. What about you? Uh, I would uh, do uh, Justin Timberlake as the <laughs> as Frank Sinatra. <laughs> That's pretty great. Nathan Fillion as the sheriff. Great. Allison Brie as the mom. Mm -hmm. And the late, great Bob Caliban as the dad. You remember Bobby the K? Uh, remind me of what Bob voiceover voiceover guy passed away like two oh, years yeah. ago. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Just yeah. the nicest guy. He would have, and <clears throat> such a character, such a character. He would have been, he would have been spectacular. Um, Poor dad. Someday I'm going to be a bodyguard just like you. Nonsense, boy. You're going to grow up to be president and presidents have bodyguards. I mean, can't you, isn't that like, that's dad's mode of when he, <clears throat> when he's doing a, a 30 he's done a lot of movies yeah. in the 30s and 40s characters and he's he does it so well i'm like that he he got that that patter that that the the the, the quick talking of those per, of those period movies well, we in a very cast realistic dad way in cast dad in it and ask okay. him to do his james gleason um and uh you already you already said who we are in the movie i you, did but i was kidding because that's oh. not real parts I okay. think that we're. I think we should both be the telegraph operators. Ah, okay. I had me as the telegraph operator, and you as the henchman who gets shot in the town. Oh, okay. So I'm I'm Paul I'm Paul Fries. I'm the yeah. tiny, stubby little guy who yeah. can't do anything in the movie. That's great. Right. The first to die. <laughs> you get an action scene. What are you talking about? The other thing we could do is you and I could bookend it. We could be the guy driving into town at the beginning of the movie and the guy driving into town at the end of the movie. The guy's asking for the, there it for is. the direction. You suddenly. Be... Suddenly what? Now that's the name. That's a funny name for a town. Oh, I don't know. I don't know about that. 
I don't know. I don't know about that. Yeah, I have that written down. But that if if we were cast as the two drivers, then in like 50 years, it would come up on some other podcast about this movie. Thanks. True. Did you know that the two guys in the in the movie who bookended the drivers did they were brothers? Isn't that cool? Totally unknown actors, but brothers. Thanks. The, 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 yeah, it would be something. That would be amazing. All the the three people that would go, huh? Huh? That's right. Welcome to suddenly. I don't know that I have anything else to talk about other than I love the old noir music. I love that stuff in here. Yeah, the it's score not particularly is actually good, but I mean, it, it's it's appropriate. It's all right. It's all right. You know, um, mostly, um, you know, I mean, there are some of the best stuff in it is the most like eye rolly American gun raw stuff. Oddly enough, like. As Jimmy Gleason says, you know, when the old boys wrote those words, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, they sounded mighty nice, but they wouldn't have been a, they wouldn't have been worth a plug nickel if somebody hadn't made them stick. Yeah. And who can disagree with that? Like, you know, I mean, there is this, this thing that they do in this movie where they state these very obvious, you know, things that are great about living in America like yes this these ideals are are really good and then they attach it immediately to mur to murdering somebody with a gun yeah. and that's an unfortunate but kind of fun uh you know problem to have is yeah. the way they seem to put it yeah she's the fact that she's made whole by finally confronting her fear and hatred of guns and killing somebody and killing somebody with one that that mm -hmm. makes her whole is one of the most disturbing messages I've seen in a movie in a while. Uh, and it doesn't leap out as disturbing because it's so leave it to beaver that you kind of don't really see it for what it is. Can I pick you up at church tomorrow? Church, guns, all guns. of it combined. Weird. Sign up Sign up this weekend for our Killing as Healing workshop. What's the gun for? Yeah, it's, it's, it's really... Um, it's it's really something, and you know what? I, it's as a, as a as a piece of American history, the movie's really interesting. I would think I would urge people to see it to get a handle if they're not aware of the history of this kind of mentality, this th these this kinds of uh, indoctrination. This mo this movie is a great example of how a lot of young American men were told their their morality, yeah. you know, when at a very early stage in their life. And it's, uh, anyway, not to get too heavy, but it's just, it's really notable. It's a really, really strange movie that way. Well. You look uncomfortable. No, I was just, I was looking at my, at the notes to talk about what we were doing next week. Okay. You want to get out of here. You just don't like this whole thing. <laughs> you're on to, you're on to next week. This show's over. <laughs> well. Tonight on Leave It to the Manchurian Candidate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Make room no. for assassin. <laughs> um, um, so next week, though. Next the week. Desperate hours. The, next is week, the Desperate Hours, yeah. 1955, Bogey, Frederick March, Mary Murphy, Arthur right. Kennedy, directed by William Wyler. Yes. That promises to be pretty good. Um, I haven't seen it in a while. It's uh, it's certainly better directed than this movie. Never seen it. All right. Uh, did you see the remake, the Michael Cimino remake? No. That was that actually had a different title. That was uh, it was uh, the Desperate Hours and Hours and Hours. Um, <laughs> the Desperate because, Four and a Half Hours. Because his movies are <laughs> long. No, this one isn't long. The studio no. had already gotten to him by that point. Oh, okay. he, he, yeah, he, he they were they had thrown. <laughs> It was a miracle they had him back, and uh, <laughs> it didn't work this time very well. Who was in the remake? Mickey Rourke, Anthony Hopkins. Ah. Which which see. sounds, you know, on paper sounds like it could be pretty kinetic, and you'd, you'd be mistaken. 
I can see why they would be desperate those hours. <laughs> um, hours of acting alone in a vacuum with yourself. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. yeah. Wow. All right. Mimi Rogers, though, is in it. She's, oh. uh, she brings a little bit of humanity. Mimi Rogers. Wow. Yeah. I haven't seen her in a while. She hasn't seen you either. <laughs> okay. And but on that. You're an American citizen. But I am an American citizen. That, yes. is, that is true. That is still true. So I guess we'll wrap it up. Thank you for joining us. This was a great show. And uh, we'll see you next week for the Desperate Hours. Elia, take us out. Suddenly. Suddenly what? Now that's the name. That's a funny name for a town. Oh, I don't know. I don't know about that. Talking about cocktails that are stylish, movies great or phony, and how Tony should win and Matthew, then Matthew should win and Tony. In the meantime, talking about film.